Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Uh, today is our Welcome Sunday. Uh, and what Welcome Sunday is about is just an opportunity for us to do a little more of what we try to do year-round, which was to be a welcoming church that makes it possible for our friends, our family, our guests, neighbors to be here with us, to be comfortable, to worship with us, and to see a little bit of what this church family is all about. Uh, today, after our worship service, normally we would have classes for adults and all ages. Uh, we won't be doing that today. Uh, instead, after worship is over, if I ever get done talking, we'll meander down the hill and there's a meal provided. Uh, part of it's potluck, part of it's provided. There's some brisket involved. It's going to be delicious. Um, so take your time here after worship is over. Meet and greet and talk and fellowship and then kind of make your way down the hill. There's going to be plenty for everybody and we'd love an opportunity to get to know you a little better. If you look around our church, look at our church bulletin or our announcement slides or our videos or our web page or our bulletin boards or anywhere else, you'll frequently see the expression, Wanderers Welcome. And Wanderers Welcome has become our, our mission statement of sorts. Uh, there's a longer version of it, but no one can remember that. So we went with the short version because a mission statement's no good if no one can remember it. And the idea is we can get two words. Wanderers Welcome has been the the staple of the church for some time and connects deeply to the idea of Welcome Sunday. Today, as part of Welcome Sunday for our, our sermon time together, I want to talk about that phrase and talk about what do we mean by Wanderer's Welcome. And I, I have two audiences in mind today as we discuss it. To the guest that's with us, I want you to know what it means. I want you to know what we are trying to accomplish. I, I want you to see what, what the goal is and whether you might want to be a part of that or at least visit from time to time. To the member of our church, today is a reminder of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to get there. So today's topic is, what do we mean by wanderers welcome? Well, there's two words in that statement, wanderers and welcome. So I'm going to break the, the cardinal rule of sermon writing. This will be a two-point sermon instead of a three-point sermon. Won't even have a poem at the end, so I've been really breaking all the rules. But we want to talk about what is a wanderer, who is a wanderer, and how might we make them welcome. First of all, what do we mean by a wanderer? Uh, I'll admit that to me it calls up um, memories of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, that not all who wander are lost, uh, was the great quote uh, from that book. But that's not actually specifically what we mean. Instead, to maybe get a sense of what it means, I'd refer, as I often do, uh, to a book that uh, a lot of Christian leaders read several years ago, and some are still reading. It was published in 2011 by a statistician. It's everything I love, Christian faith and math, all put together, all the good things. And the book was titled, You Lost Me, written by David Kinnaman. Kinnaman is a guy that's been very influential in helping communicate to churches of all shapes and kinds what's going on in churches around the country, uh, working with Barna and other statistical groups and researchers. Our staff actually got to go to a conference at OC uh, about, a, was it a year ago? About a year ago and got to hear David Kinnaman talk. Um, there were other people there. We were there for Kinnaman. We wanted to hear what did he have to say, what's going on out there, what's the data tell us, how is Christianity playing out in the world and in people's lives, and it was rewarding. In his book, You Lost Me, what he did was try to examine what's happening in Christian churches. Specifically, he reported, and this was back in 2011, that something like 60% of high school students who go to a church like this one somewhere in America won't be going to one as an adult. Uh, I don't know if that number is up or down. I doubt it's down. But it was a startling statistic that there were a, an increasing number of people who started in a church and didn't end up there. Or as the title said, they would say, you lost me. And he specifically identified the group of people that we've come to know as millennials, which in 2011, he was focused on people who are 18 or 19 years old, uh, 
through the next 15 years of their life. Okay? Here's the fun thing. It's now been 12 or 13 years since he wrote that book. And so the 18 to 30-year-old group going into their 30s at that time are now having families. They are now the 20 to 40-year-old group going into their 40s with slightly graying hair around their temples, ever so slightly, well-earned. Those are the people that he was talking about. They've gotten a little older. And they are exactly the families that this church in our family ministry has said we need to focus on that particular group of people. We want them back. We want them to return to churches. We want them to be part of churches and healthy disciples in churches. What Kinnaman said, and and he's going to talk about that age group, but it's not specific to them. His research is, but I think you'll find in these stories he tells, uh, information that applies to people of all ages. He says there are basically three groups of people that are walking out of churches and not coming back. Three groups of wanderers. And the first, he says, are nomads. Uh, He says these are people that have a slow fade away from church without ever really giving up their faith. This person, if you ask him or her, are you a Christian? They'll probably say yes. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Shrug, I suppose. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. I mean, as opposed to something else, probably. That in principle, they never made a decision to stop being Christian. Okay? But then if you ask him the next question, when was the last time you attended a worship service of some kind of Christian church? That's when the answer gets tougher. It may have been years and years or even since childhood. So this is a person that uh, Kenneman would say is simply disenchanted. They never gave up their faith. They just also never became motivated by it as adults. The Christian faith in principle still lives in their life, but there's no real strong attachment to the concrete world of church, of worship service or Bible class or service ministries. They've gone and done other things in their life that have become very important to them and very interesting to them. And the, the magic, if we can call it that, that surrounds church life is lost to them. He calls these the nomads. He says they're out there. They never made a decision to just stop being Christian, but they're just kind of wandering without a home. The second group of people he calls prodigals, based, as you might guess, on Luke, the 15th chapter in the story of the prodigal son. He says these are people that really did deconvert from their faith, that something happened and they made the conscious decision, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. You ask them, are are you a Christian? They say, not anymore. And this person likely has some kind of intellectual disagreement with the church or with Christianity as they have known it. They'll mention things like miracles are really hard to believe in, especially for somebody who also believes in science. It's really hard to believe in the things I read in my Bible and be a rational person who believes in the nuts and bolts of the physical universe that I learned about in high school. Or they might say there are things that God did in the Christian Bible, uh, acts of violence that they say I find inexplicable contradictory to everything I could possibly believe about God. Or they may say there are positions held about morality, about social policy, or other things by Christians that simply don't line up with everything I know about the world. So intellectually, I just can't buy into what Christians are selling. But more often than even that, or even accompanied by that, Kinnaman said there's almost always a deep emotional wound. And if you get them talking, they'll tell you about the time that church hurt them. Some person hurt them. Some person or some group of people in their church hurt them. They have a wound, a hurt, that came from the very place that God gave the task of healing. 
And because of that experience, the intellectual complaint is still there, but it's deep down inside the hurt, the wound that has made them say, I can't be that anymore. This is the prodigal wanderer. And then the third group that Kinnaman mentions, he says, are exiles. And I found this group, uh, all of them are interesting, but I found this really interesting. Um, because these are people that, if you meet them, are actually passionately active in doing good. Specifically among millennials, uh, volunteerism and service is at an all-time high. These are people that are passionate about doing good in their job, in their life, in their spare time, but they don't see how their vocation their life's work, their career, their job, whatever it is they're doing with their life, connects to their church. They learned to do good from the church, but they don't see the connection between that good and the church itself. They would say, if you asked them, why did you quit going to church, or why did you leave the church, they'd say, no, friend, the church left me. The church taught me to care about big, important things in the world, and then the church didn't. And so these are people that, again, didn't deconvert. They didn't decide one day, I don't believe in Jesus. They just don't see a connection between what happens here and what they were taught to care about. Those are the three groups of people that Kinnaman identifies as wanderers. And I think in one of those stories, you can possibly hear a little bit of your own. It doesn't matter about your age. You don't have to be a millennial. It doesn't matter. But you can hear in that stories that you identify with or recognize. If you're a guest today and maybe haven't been in a church in a long time, maybe that's one of the reasons, somewhere in those stories. Or maybe, maybe you're a longtime member of this church, but every Sunday you think, is today the day I don't go back? And it's one of these stories that plays out in your head. This is the kind of person with this struggle that we are talking about when we say wanderers are welcome. Wanderers welcome means becoming a church that welcomes these wanderers home. And I worded that in that very specific way because it matters. The, this group of people, it, in each of those three categories, the problem was not some activity the church wasn't doing. The problem was what the church was and is. You will not bring the wanderer back home by adding, well, we'll do this particular kind of ministry or this particular thing or we'll make really flashy flyers or something. Like there's not some thing that you can just tack on to what we're doing and say, ah, that'll fix it. Now they'll all come back. Folks, if that existed, every church in the country would already be doing it. That silver bullet is not a reality. What has to happen to welcome the wanderer home is for a church to become a kind of church where that wanderer is welcome. It's not about an extra thing we do. It is about our identity and who we are that has to be transformed. We have to ask a question why would that person ever want to be here? And every church has to be asking that question, but certainly it's one we want to focus on at Central. So, okay, we've got our wanderers. We have an idea of who they are. How do we welcome them? And for this, uh, I turn away from the statistics, and I want us to think about the Scriptures for a moment. And there was a time where this was a very live question in, in a particular church in the New Testament. So they had millennials? No, they didn't. Um, different millennia, as it turns out. But they did have similar issues. The Church of Rome would be my example case. Uh, first of all, to understand, there's no such thing as the Church of Rome in this era. There's not one church with a sign out front and times of service and everyone shows up on Sunday morning. These are a collection, a loose collection of house churches that exist in the world's grandest city, metropolitan ancient Rome. And these house churches were as diverse as the families that hosted them. And the people they encountered in Rome 
were as diverse as the mass of humanity you would meet in any major city today. Last night, Selene and I got to go on a date. We had tickets to uh, Civic Center performance, and so we're there at the Civic Center, and you look around at the people that are there. And one thing you notice is the diversity of kinds of people and background. People that are there uh, on a date from Ada, Oklahoma, people that live downtown, people that are wealthy, people that were scraping by to get their tickets, people that uh, the homeless guy who was outside the Civic Center, like when you're in a metropolitan area, you encounter so many different varieties of people. So think about that. Now you're thinking about Rome. It's a thousand years ago, but that principle is the same. Lots of different backgrounds, lots of different people. And the question that's asked towards the end of the book of Romans is how do we welcome that mass of humanity into our number to share in the gospel of Christ? In Romans 14 and Romans 15, Paul gives some very specific instructions, and to help me out, because he knew I'd be writing this sermon today, he even uses the word welcome repeatedly to give us a sense of what he's talking about. How do we welcome wanderers? Paul's going to give us four very specific things to focus on. Here's number one, Romans 14, 1 through 2. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Try really hard not to get distracted by the vegetable conversation. There's, there's a conversation going on in the Church of Rome that has nothing to do with us today. They were having an argument about what kind of foods were okay to eat. And specifically, it involved uh, food that had been used in some kind of pagan ritual and uh, not. And you had people that were converting from paganism, who had their sensibility. You had Jewish folks that had their dietary sensibility. And all these different backgrounds, again, all that diversity, meeting together and trying to share a meal. And the question was literally, what's for dinner? And trying to figure out what's okay. okay. That's the conversation. That's not our conversation. I have to tell you, I have never attended a church where they had that conversation. I have never had a Sunday morning sermon. I've never given one, and I've never heard one where they said, today, we need to really decide if it's okay to offer meat uh, to idols and then eat it later, right? It's just not a live conversation for us. But the question at the heart of it is, because what they had and what every church has had ever since is the big story of the gospel and the smaller issues that play out in people's lives as we try to live the gospel. There's the most important things and the less important things. And for 2,000 years, this has been a fact. It is true today. If Christianity is here 2,000 years from now and the earth is still spinning, it will still be true. That the less important things work really hard to get in the way of the most important things. And what Paul says is, if you want to be a church that welcomes a person in, you have to make sure you're not quarreling over what he calls opinions, the less important things. If the first a person comes into your assembly, he's not even, in my mind, not even answering the question of what's the right answer. He does answer that. Paul does have an opinion on what you should have for dinner. He gives some explanation of that later on. He says just because something is associated with paganism doesn't mean you're a pagan. Uh, he says there's a difference there, and it's worth mentioning. He says, but that's not the point. The point is, if you're trying to share the gospel and someone comes in and they hear an hour-long argument about what's for dinner, he says, they're not going to want to be there, and neither are you. That's not what Christianity is about. He says, if you want to make people welcome, the less important things have to be treated as less important things, and the most important things have to be treated as the most important things. So for us, the lesson is, we want to welcome wanderers by not majoring in minors, is the way my parents said it growing up. Don't major in minors. There's a lot of small things that we could talk about in any church on the planet. There's one gospel. Which one of those should be our centerpiece? Which one is the thing that we want to share with the world, with our community, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors? 
there's one thing that matters most, and everything else has to be secondary. And we have to actually act like it. All of us believe it. I could, I could go to every church on the planet, I'm guessing, I haven't done it, but I could go to every church on the planet and I could ask them, what's the most important thing? And they'd say, Christ and Him crucified, because they're Christians and we know the answer. But send the guest into that same church and then ask the guest, what was the most important thing? And their answer might surprise you. Look at the life of that church and say, what do they tend to emphasize? Where do they spend their time and resources? And the answer might surprise you. So one of our goals in welcoming the wanderer is by saying, we're going to major in majors. We're going to put the first thing first. We're going to show you what matters to us and make that the center of our life and our faith. A couple of verses later, Paul has these words to say as well. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Remember now, this conversation is about what's for dinner, but Paul is making another point. He says, while you're arguing about what's for dinner, you're also judging the person who thinks differently than you do. You are despising them or condemning them. And he accuses everybody of it. It's a broad brush. He says, you're all doing it. People that eat, people that don't eat, everybody's doing it. We're all sitting back silently saying, boy, they're not as good a folk as I am. They're not as good a Christian as I am. not as good a disciple as I am. They're not doing it right. And he says, all of us do it. Both sides of the argument are doing it. And what's, what gets forgotten in that? It's the end of the sentence. It's beautiful. For God has welcomed him. Why is a person in a church? We could answer that lots of different observations about background and history and conversion and family and whatever. Paul says there's actually a simpler answer. A person's there because God brought them there. They are there because in their life God has been at work to bring them to His Son, Jesus Christ. And now He's brought them here to be with you, to share in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God brought that person here. God was the door greeter. God was the one who opened up and said, you come in. God welcomed that person in. And Paul says, who are you to judge a person that God welcomed? To be a wanderer's welcome church, we have to make sure that we are not judging the journey that wanderers have been on. People get here in different ways. Some of you got here by way of three or four generations of family and Christian faith. Some of you got here by way of prison. And every version of that in between. I spent a lot of time in the last year getting to know some of you better, especially in family ministry, but also in one-on-one -on -one meetings. And every one of you has a different story. Nobody got here the same way. Which is the right way to get here? As long as you're here, Paul says that's the right way to get here. God welcomed this person here, and it's not our business to judge the journey. We want, wanderers, we want to welcome wanderers by not judging their journey. By saying, however you got here, we're glad you're here. And not being focused on the windy road of the past and the mess that God was working through to get them here. That's challenging because as humans, we don't think that way. We want to know how they got here. They want to know what they did. And maybe secretly down inside, if we're being really honest, really honest, we want to know if we're better than they are. We don't ever say that part out loud. But we think it a lot. God welcomed you here. God welcomed me here. Who are we to be any different than to welcome those whom God has welcomed?
we want to welcome wonders by not judging their journey. In the next chapter, chapter 15, he picks up this theme again and has a little more to say. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. How do we treat a person who comes into our number who is with us? He says, we focus on their needs rather than our wants. We ask ourselves, what would help them to be here rather than how can I get them to fit into my church that's the way I want it? And that's another hard one because it means being very selfless about things, even things that matter to me. But here's, I think, what Paul challenges us to remember. Um, I'm not trying to be egotistical when I say this, but when he talks about the strong, I assume he's talking about a person like me. And what I mean by that is, I grew up in a Christian home. I followed my dad around to Bible lectureships and church meetings and everything from the time I could walk. Okay? I don't get up on Sunday morning and say, I wonder if I should go to church today. Right? That decision was made when I was 10 or something, right? I mean, it's just, it's built in. That is an easy choice for me every day. And because, again, I'm a minister, and of course I'm going to be here. If tomorrow I wasn't a minister, it would still be a choice where I'd say, well, of course I'm going. I might ask myself where, right? Like all of you do on a Sunday. But the question of going wouldn't be a question. I wouldn't say, am I a Christian this week? I might evaluate what I'm doing and where I want to be, but the question, am I a Christian? Well, of course I am. But this other person is not in that situation. This other person is not church shopping. They're not saying, do I want to go to this church or that church or which one suits me best? They're, the wanderer is asking, should I be here at all? Should I be a participant in this called Christianity? Can I believe any of it? Can I buy in in any way, shape, or form? Their choice that they're making is not between this church or that church. It's not Walmart versus Target. They're saying, should I be part of this at all? For me, what happens then becomes a want. I'd like it better if it were this way. But for them, the question is a need. Is this something that should be in my life at all? See the difference in the question? And so what Paul says is, those of us that are strong, we have wants. We have things that we'd like to be a certain way. But our, what we're supposed to be doing is looking at the weaker person and saying, how can I make it easier for them to be here? How can I make it so that they can be here at all? How can I make sure, to say it negatively, that they don't walk back out the door and out of Christian faith forever? How can I focus on them? That's the wanderer's welcome attitude. We want to welcome wonder by putting their needs above our wants. The person we are trying to reach with the gospel above the person who has received it and lived it all their life. We say, how can I help you? Because I got what I needed. My family was there for me as a child. I was born in a culture that shared with me the Christian faith, and I've got it. Praise be to God, through no effort of my own, I was blessed to grow up in that environment. Maybe you weren't. I got what I need. How can I help you find what I found in Jesus Christ? putting your need above my wants. And then, to kind of close us out with a fourth point, how can we be a wandering, wanderer welcome church? Two verses here, still in chapter 15. He says, For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. The ultimate test for what a church is supposed to be is not even the question of do we reach millennials or are we something that we want to be or need to be. It's not a question of uh, are we meeting the expectations of this book or that book. That's not the question. The ultimate test of what kind of church it should be is, is that what Jesus always has been? The church must be nothing less than an extension of the life of Jesus Christ. 
How did Christ make wanderers welcome? He did it every day. And he did it with all the things we've just discussed by taking on himself the burden of welcoming them. He did not please himself, but rather took on the reproaches of the reproached. (laughs) He took on the pain and the difficulty of other people's lives so that they would have a place with the Father. A couple of verses later, he says this, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. How do we become a wanderer's welcome church? He says, you see people the way Jesus already sees them. We see people the way Jesus sees us and the way Jesus sees them. He doesn't see the mess and condemn He sees all that and he goes to the cross and says, I'll take it. He's the door greeter welcoming them into his church. He sees them and he loves them. And he says, you have a place here. A wanderer's welcome church says, I've got to think like he thinks. My standard can't be different than his standard. My thoughts can't be different than his thoughts. My affections can't be different than his affections. I've got to start seeing the world through the lens of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me close today with a disclaimer, because you're not supposed to, but I do. Wanderer's welcome is an aspiration, not a description. I have told you today, whether you're a member or a guest, what we are trying to be. On any given Sunday and any given day of the week, you could come here and say, well, that's not And you could point to something and say, that wasn't very welcoming, or this wasn't that, or that person majored in minors, or that person didn't see me the way Christ saw me. Absolutely. We be sinners here. We are flawed. What I'm describing to you is not a sales pitch that says, here we've perfected the model, come be here. What I'm telling you is, this is what we hope we are becoming. We believe that this is what God wants us to be, and that by aspiring to it, we become more like it day after day, week after week, year after year, until the welcoming church is welcomed home by the Christ who purchased it in the first place. This is who we want to be, and I hope you want to be a part of it. To bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, we know in this world there are many who struggle to accept and live out the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. We know a lot of them are here. We know a lot of them are us. Father, we ask that you help us be transformed into precisely the kind of church you would have us to be, one that welcomes the wanderer as you have welcomed us. Help us to see every soul as you have seen us. Help us to put first things first and never to judge the journey that you have led others on to exactly where you'd have them to be. Help us to do all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the patience, the love, and affection that he has taught us and teaches us day by day until you welcome us all home. This we pray. In his name, amen.